while Confucius is more popularly known to the average man in the West, a small group of critics and scholars in this country, for some years now, have been strong admirers of Lao Tzu and his extraordinary little volume. In fact, I may venture the opinion that among scholars who know the Orient, there are more devotees of Lao Tzu than of Confucius. And the case is rare when a discerning reader does not fall under the affable charm of the book. For while good sense belongs to Confucius, wit and depth and brilliance belong to the Taoist sage, whose name has been aptly and affectionately translated as the old boy. Mysticism usually frightens the people of a rational temper. Chiefly because of the extravagances of some of his devotees, but the mysticism of Lao Tzu, Whitman, and Eddington need not. When Lao Tzu and Zhuang Zi spoke in mystic phraseology of the elusiveness of Tao, it must be remembered that they were not being mystic, but merely good observers of life. For it must be remembered. That it is exactly this quality of elusiveness of life processes that confronts the thinking scientist in his laboratory. When the highest type of men hear the Tao, they try hard to live in accordance with it. When the mediocre hear the Tao, they seem to be aware and yet unaware of it. When the lowest type hear of Tao. They break into loud laughter. If it were not laughed at, it would not be Tao. I am quite sure that the reaction of the majority of readers on first looking into Lao Tzu's book will be to laugh. I say this without any disrespect, for I did that myself. The highest type of scholars end by laughing with Lao Tzu at the preoccupations of the philosophers of the day. After that, Lao Tzu becomes a lifelong friend.